When God is invisible behind the world, the contents of the world will become new gods. When the symbols of transcendent religiosity are banned, new symbols develop from the inner worldly language of science to take their place. Eric Bogling. I've been lately diving into the work of Eric Bogling and I'm truly amazed by the profoundness of his thought and how well it mirrors the thought of Peirce. What I like about Vogling is the way he fearlessly tackles the big questions of philosophy, like what is the meaning of our existence, or on what basis should we order our society. Furthermore, I like Vogling's bluntness. He views modernity as Gnostic and as a sickness, so he really doesn't pull his punches. But it's amazing how well Peirce and Vogling go together, and I think it is because they both had a very clear perception of the fundamental nature of reality. They had a common object of inquiry. They saw the same thing. They have, of course, a very different approach to the inquiry. Peirce is much more logical and is on this kind of a sub-metaphysical level, whereas Vogling is a more existential philosopher with a historical and political perspective. But nevertheless, they are like brothers in arms, where Vogling with his bluntness is leading the charge, and Peirce with his all-encompassing logical framework is providing the logistics. In this video, I'll be exploring the parallels in their thought, touching upon topics such as the rejection of materialism, the pursuit of the transcendent, grappling with the challenges of modernity, and the essence of philosophy itself. But why bring these two thinkers together? What's the benefit? Well, we can approach this question through a metaphor. The all-encompassing logical framework of Peirce is like a field with a very fruitful soil, and the thought of other thinkers are like seeds. Now, when these are separate, both of them remain in a state of potential. But when brought together, well, then we have a good harvest. But who is Eric Bogley? And why is his thought so profound? Eric Bogling was born in Cologne, Germany in 1901, but he mainly studied at the University of Vienna in Austria. There he became an associate professor in the law faculty. But in 1938 he had to flee the Nazi regime to the United States, where he then spent most of his academic career. Now, Eric Vogling is often described as a political scientist, and while this is true, limiting him to that label would be a massive understatement. Vogling is better characterized as a philosopher with a deep insight into the Western philosophical tradition. In the Eric Vogling reader, Vogling is described as a philosopher of existence and history. Here's a quote. Vogling's work as a whole is a critical analysis and assessment of the entire political, religious and philosophical heritage of the West. Vogling is thus a deep thinker who goes into the depths of reality and existence. But it's true that political, in its broadest sense, is at the center of Vogling's thought. In his philosophy, Vogling asks the question, on what basis should we order our society? And in order to answer that question, Vogling wanted to analyze all of the symbols that shaped us through history. And this brings us to the very key concept of Vogling, namely the symbol. Vogling started a multi-volume work called The History of Political Ideas, but after completing about 4,000 pages, he abandoned the project as he came to the realization that actually it isn't ideas that lie at the basis of societies, it is symbols. So what's the difference? Ideas for Vogling are something that can become detached from experience and thereby deformed, whereas symbols are connected to the transcendent. Transcendent is the another key concept for Vogling. It refers to the experience of the eternal, the infinite, the divine. 
And even though transcendent can never be fully described, the form of it can be conveyed through symbols. And these symbols then form the basis of society, where that society seeks to emulate or reflect or mirror the form of the transcendent order. So it is symbols that form the basis of political order. In this search, Vogling formed his own comprehensive philosophical framework, but his thought is characterized as unconventional and not fitting into any of the contemporary schools of philosophy. But could Vogling maybe find a new home in the Persian framework? Vogling's philosophy can be seen as a rejection of positivism. Now, by positivism is meant here the worldview or philosophical stance that only physical reality is real, that the whole reality consists of individual physical objects that are fully quantifiable and clear and precise. Furthermore, positivists see that the whole of reality can be described through a set of value-free propositions about the various states and behaviors of those objects. According to Vogling, the problem with positivism is that it only recognizes a part of reality, whereas Vogling starts from what he calls the full range of human experience. It encompasses the physical world, of course, but Vogling sees that there is also a more deeper reality that is conveyed to us through symbols. For Vogling, the symbols point to a more deeper reality that is beyond and beneath merely the spatial temporal world. In parallel to Vogling, Peirce's philosophy can be seen as a rejection of nominalism, which is the worldview that reality consists only of individual separate particulars. So nominalism denies the reality of generals and universals. This is more or less the same as positivism. Positivism can be seen as an instance of nominalism. Therefore, we see that they both have a common point of critique. Peirce's categories can clarify the issue at hand. The universe of secondness is the universe of forceful action, forceful existence bruteness, the, the materiality of the world. The universe of secondness is something that can be seen and touched and felt. This is the universe for nominalists and positivists. Actually, this is the only universe that they regard as real. Now, the universe of thirdness, on the other hand, is the universe of continuity, generality, uh, lawfulness, habituality, uh, and I would say the transcendent. The belief in the reality of the universe of thirdness is what makes someone a realist. So both Vogling and Peirce see that philosophy should start from this full spectrum of experience, from the experience of all the universes of experience, all three of them to be precise. It would be a great philosophical mistake to limit your inquiry to just one of those universes. Immediately it's clear how fruitful it is to bring these two thinkers together. Peirce is the more fundamental one, diving into the, into the foundations of logic and seeing nominalism as a hindrance to a good logic. We cannot have firmly based logic if we don't believe in the universe of thirdness. If we adopt a nominalist worldview, we must give up logic as something universal and objective. And logic becomes a natural science. It inquires how we humans psychologically think. Whereas Percy is that the laws of logic are independent of our thought. They would be there even if there weren't any humans. Now, on the other hand, Vogling approaches reality from a more existential and civilizational perspective. For him, positivism or nominalism is an inadequate way to answer the human condition. Human societies can't really 
properly order themselves if they deny the reality of the transcendent, or the reality of thirdness. The denial of the reality of the transcendent order results in nothing else than a confession that a science of human and social order did not exist. So, from a sociological perspective, what happens to our society when we deny the transcendent is that our society fundamentally changes. Its perception of itself changes. Instead of seeing the society as mirroring the order of the transcendent, conveyed to us true symbols, the order of society becomes arbitrary. It's a matter of convention. We can do whatever we want. And the meaning of politics changes from it being a sort of a preservation of that order to becoming just a power play. But Vogling said that positivism is an inadequate way to answer the human condition. So what's the human condition and why it needs an answer? Now, before we continue with the video, I'd like to mention that I've also written a Substack post on this same subject. So if you're enjoying this video, I'm certain that you will appreciate the post as well. For more philosophical explorations like this one, make sure to subscribe the channel. But now, back to the video. For Vogling, the most elementary fact of human existence is that it is an embodied participation in reality driven by a conscious search for meaning. So the basic question for us becomes, what is the meaning of my existence? Because our existence does not cause itself, it cannot explain itself. Therefore, we must look outside of our existence and to try to find some origin or source for it. This is what Vogling calls the ground of existence. So. The ground is both the source and the end towards which our mind tend to. Because we are searching for origin, right? At the same time, we are trying to understand the nature of that origin. So it is the beginning and the end of the inquiry, the alpha and the omega. So therefore, we can understand our consciousness as being attention towards this ground which is driven by its desire to know that ground. But here comes the kicker, the core move of Vogling. Namely, according to Vogling, we can recognize this tension only when we discern that the ground of existence is transcendent. It's unconditioned by time or space. To put it simply, it's the realization that our existence cannot be explained solely by the universe itself. We have to connect our existence, the ground of our existence, with something which is beyond the universe, as something transcendent. Now, this is a big claim. This is the, I guess, the main claim of Vogling, what, what, what makes Vogling Vogling. According to Vogling, our entire existence is defined by the search for the ground. It is what we are doing, right? We are asking the question, what's the meaning of my life? What's the purpose of my life? What I am doing here? What is this thing all about? But we try to find those answers through materialistic means, through gaining status, power, wealth, to indulge in all kinds of, of, of desires. Uh, but nothing earthly can satisfy that that desire to know the ground of reality, because it is transcendent. Well, okay, if nothing material or imminent can satisfy that search, how, what does the search look like then? Well, in the West, the Greeks were the first ones who really had a clear idea of the structure of human consciousness. The Greeks believe that our intellect or news can participate with the transcendent, and the Greeks had the view that the purpose of humans is to function as a mediator in between the transcendent and imminent and bring about order. Now, this exact same idea is expressed also in Christianity, uh, where 
The purpose of human is seen as a mediator between the heaven and earth. So in the two main pillars of the Western tradition, in the Greeks and Christianity, they both share basically the same idea about the purpose of us. Now, Peirce, on the other hand, didn't approach this question from such a strong existential point of view. He was once again grappling with logic itself. Now, in one of the Lovell lectures in 1903, Peirce asks a very big question. What's the ultimate aim of man? And this leads him to ponder about the nature of reason, which he says is something that can never be fully embodied. Peirce continues, The essence of reason is such that its being never can have been completely perfected. It always must be in a state of incipiency, of growth. No son of Adam has ever fully manifested what there was in him. This development of reason consists in embodiment, that is, in manifestation. Under this conception, the ideal of conduct will be to execute our little function in the operation of the creation by giving a hand toward rendering the world more reasonable whenever, as the slang is, it is up to us to do so. Let's unpack this. For Peirce, reason isn't static. It isn't even imminent. Reason is dynamic, living force, or generality that seeks to manifest itself in the world. Peirce believes that the universe uh, has the tendency to become ever more reasonable. Or to put it more precisely, the concrete manifestations of reasonableness become ever more prevalent. Now, if I understand Peirce right, it seems to me that he is saying that the purpose of humans is to aid the universe in this transformation towards more reasonableness. So, in other words, humans are functioning as mediators between the reason, which is transcendent, and the world, which is imminent, which is basically the same basic idea which the Greeks or the Christians have. But Peirce didn't use the word transcendent so much, so are we reading too much into Peirce? Perhaps. But in my defense, I must say that already quite early in his life, Peirce recognized that the laws of logic are independent of our minds. Now, many logicians like John Stuart Mill saw logic as the science that inquires how humans think. So it becomes sort of a natural science. Peirce rejected that view, saying that the laws of logic are independent of us. They are independent of metaphysics, which means that they are independent of time and space itself, which for me sounds that they are transcendent. So Peirce explicitly says on many occasions that if we don't regard the laws of logic as being independent of the metaphysical structure of our universe, then we lose the objectivity or the universality of those laws. And sometimes Peirce confesses, I believe, he's believed in the transcendent quite directly. It so happens that I myself believe in the eternal life of the ideas, truth and right. So the belief in the transcendent is very important to both Vogling and Peirce. For Vogling, if we abandon the transcendent, we cannot find meaning or purpose in our lives and our societies grumble. For Peirce, if we abandon the idea of transcendent, then we lose logic itself. But why the idea of transcendent sounds so odd to us? Why it is so hard for us to believe in the transcendent, let alone believe in God? Well, this is because our modern minds. As children of modernity, we have become sick. According to Vogelin, whenever a civilization has discovered the transcendent ground, it has undergone massive transformation. Now the civilization perceives its source as the transcendent and the end point as transcendent. The cosmos is now 
split into two, into the infinite and the finite, into the transcendent and the immanent. But Vogling is very clear that these are not two separated chunks of being, but a unity, albeit with a tension. For Vogling, this realization is a massive thing. It is something that we still grapple with. Despite our society saying that it has moved beyond any idea of transcendent, beyond any, any of these superstitious beliefs of the past, Vogling sees that we are far from being settled with this idea. Actually, Vogling says that our modern problems stem from our abandonment of the transcendent. Modernity could be conceptualized as the attempt to relocate perfect beauty, perfect goodness, perfect truth back to the imminent reality. From this denial of the transcendent stems the cult of progress. That is the idea that science just by itself could solve all the problems of humanity, could answer all the questions and mysteries, and could get rid of all of these primitive superstitions that still linger around. Vogling sees this as a mistake, and as a dangerous mistake, as this pursuit of perfectibility limited to the imminent world leads to utopian thinking. By limiting the purpose of humans to this world, we lose the idea that we are participating with the eternal, with the infinite, with the divine. Berkeley labels this era as the existential closure to the transcendent ground, and this is something that pervades our whole society. Listen, for example, this short speech by Christopher Hitchens. If you want to be awe-inspired, ladies and gentlemen, and let me say, let me just tell you that those of us who do not believe we are divinely created, let alone divinely supervised, are not immune to the idea of awe and beauty and the, the transcendent. Let me invite you to look for a moment at the pictures taken by the Hubble telescope. Some of you may have done it. If you haven't done it now, or yet, do it soon. The extraordinary revelations of, 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 of swirling, yet somehow beautiful new galaxies uh, in, in color and depth and majesty, like nothing I think the human eye has ever seen. Turn away from that if you wish, and, say, and gaze at a burning bush in an illiterate desert part of the Middle East and say that that's where revelation comes from. I don't believe you'll be able to do it. In this speech, Hitchens tries to pursue us to shift our gaze from the transcendent to the imminent by presenting all of these visually very tempting images and contrasting them with known biblical images of the divine. Hitchens says that although I don't believe in anything transcendent, I'm still feeling these feelings of awe, I'm still struck by the beauty of the universe. But in reality, Hitchens is reducing beauty to feeling. He's not advocating for a sense of meaning or purpose. No, he's advocating for a simple feeling of awe, that looking at these beautiful constellations make us feel good, but there is no meaning. There is no purpose to any of this. Instead of understanding beauty as something that reflects or mirrors the eternal beauty of the transcendent, it becomes confined to this world. It becomes self-referential. Something is beautiful because it makes us feel good, not because it is a manifestation of something ideal. I find it interesting that when this question comes up, and this comes up a lot, that if we adopt this materialist, atheistic worldview, then we have to give up beauty and all of these kind of aesthetic qualities of our experience. Then the other side immediately pulls up these pictures of galaxies and stars and says, look at these, these are very beautiful. And yes, they are beautiful but seldom do they pull up pictures of mothers holding their babies or, uh, or some person helping their neighbor. And I wonder why that is the case. Could it be that a materialist has a hard time finding those things conceptually beautiful? Um, 
because they are not visually as stimulating as some nebula or the helix of a DNA. Could it also be that from this kind of a strict Darwinian point of view, human interaction is defined as struggle and competition instead of seeing it as a potential participation with the divine? I don't know. Maybe I'm too hyperbolic here, but this is just something that I have noticed. But back to Vogling. In addition uh, to criticizing the modernity from this denial of the reality of the transcendent, Vogling is maybe most famous from um, conceptualizing or describing modernity as being inherently Gnostic. Ancient Gnosticism saw the world as inherently evil place ruled by evil, and the purpose of humans was to be liberated spiritually from this evil place, and this could be done through acquiring certain knowledge known as Gnosis. Bergling sees modern political ideologies as Gnostic because they promise a complete transformation of the world through this kind of special, often esoteric and occult, knowledge that can be wielded only by experts. So there is this element of domination, of exerting human control over the world. This basic idea or attitude is behind every revolutionary ideology, at least since the French Revolution. In our modern day, it's the technocratic attitude wielded by many. However, in contrast to ancient Gnosticism, which promised a liberation from this imminent world to the spiritual world, modern Gnosticism promises an imminent liberation, which shifts our gaze completely off the transcendent. But this becomes possible only after the ground of existence is deemed completely imminent. If the ground of existence is seen as something transcendent, it is beyond our full control, it is beyond our domination, and it is something that we must conform to. And this idea of the transcendent ground produces humility in us. But this hurts the ego of the modern mind, which lacks humility and is very proud. And this pride is the driving force behind revolutions and utopias of modernity. So modernity, in a sense, turns everything upside down. It denies the transcendent and sees humanity as the only source of divinity. And this is very dangerous thinking, which can be seen from the atrocities of the 20th century totalitarian ideologies. But the problems of this thinking can be also recognized on a more personal level. If the fundamental human condition is a search for meaning, and that meaning can only be provided by the transcendent, then it becomes evident why our materialist scientific paradigm cannot sustain our society, why there is so much feelings of, of purposelessness, aimlessness, meaninglessness in our society. It is no wonder we have abandoned the transcendent, the only possible source of meaning and purpose that could satisfy that search. That is something that we all share in our lives. We all search for that meaning. The meaning crisis we are facing is completely expected outcome of the attempt of modernity to relocate perfect beauty, perfect goodness, perfect truth to the imminent world. By reducing reality to matter, we shift our focus from the transcendent to ourselves, and we search meaning and purpose from ourselves, which is completely fruitless, because our existence does not explain our own existence. By disconnecting and separating ourselves from the transcendent, we become limited. Everything is limited to the imminent. The death of God has revealed us how we have a thirst for meaning and purpose, which nothing imminent can truly satisfy. And this is the reason we are left unfulfilled, anxious and aimless. But what about Perth? Well, 
Powers believed that through earnest scientific inquiry, we could more fully participate with the transcendent order, or what Peirce called the living generalities, by embodying the form of the transcendent, by being more and more fully in participation with that underlying order, we get our deep sense of meaning and purpose to our lives. And this is basically what Vogelin is also saying. In other words, we are the mediators between the transcendent and the immanent. And this is where we find our meaning and purpose. So how to participate in that mediation? How to draw closer to the transcendent? These are the core questions of philosophy. So how do Vogling and Peirce understand the nature of philosophy? Firstly, philosophy is a loving search for wisdom. The philosopher must be open to the reality and the philosopher must love the object of inquiry, which is experience in its fullness. Vogling puts it beautifully. Philosophy springs from the love of being. It is man's loving endeavor to perceive the order of being and attune himself to it. The philosopher must thus seek to understand reality in its own terms. We cannot be too critical or close-minded. We have to have this kind of a loving and open attitude to the reality, a sort of a innocent curiosity. Peirce puts it beautifully as well. Suppose, for example, that I have an idea that interests me. It is my creation. I love it and I will sink myself perfecting it. It is not by dealing out cold justice to the circle of my ideas that I can make them grow, but by cherishing and tending them as I would the flowers in my garden. The love of being must extend to the whole of reality. The philosopher can't be agnostic who hates the world and thinks that it's an evil place. Now, Obviously, this requires faith, and this is why Vogling says that the essence of truth is trust, and Peirce expresses this same idea. But the saving truth is that there is a thirdness in experience, an element of reasonableness to which we can train our own reason to conform more and more. We should at once hope that it is so, since in that hope, lies the only possibility of any knowledge. Furthermore, Peirce's concept of amusement, I think, tries to describe this very attitude. Amusement is sort of a playful and innocent attitude to all of the universes of reality, all of the universes of experience. And amusement, I think, presupposes that we think that the ground of these universes is good in itself. It would be an impossible thing to have a sort of hateful amusement. Moreover, Peirce explicitly asserted that the fundamental main evolutionary force in our universe is unconditional love, agape. So this kind of a loving openness to the world and reality is something that best mirrors the form of the divine. It interests me to notice that these three sentiments of logic seem to be pretty much the same as the famous trio of charity, faith and hope, which in the estimation of St. Paul are the finest and greatest of spiritual gifts. Secondly, for Vogling, philosophy is an unending pursuit. We can never attain complete wisdom, because as philosophers, or as human beings, we are also participants in the very process we are trying to inquire. Our viewpoint is always within the process, uh, within the object of inquiry itself. Additionally, reality isn't static. It can't be described with a fixed set of propositions, because reality is growing, reality is living. Uh, it is something akin to a poem, as Peirce describes it. And what is a poem? What's the meaning of a poem? It can never be sort of 
be fixed. It is always open for, for novel interpretations. Ultimately, the ground of existence, the transcendent ground, remains a mystery. Of course, we can always draw closer to it. We can always participate more and more with it. We can always learn new things about it. But as it is infinite and eternal, we can never fully grasp it. But the movement towards it is also eternal and infinite. Thirdly, for Vogling, philosophy is something deeply personal. It is something that should be engaged wholeheartedly, because it encompasses whole experience. Philosophy should lead into a personal transformation. And in essence, philosophy is not a purely intellectual pursuit. It's a way of life, because by engaging in an earnest philosophical inquiry, we become conformed more and more to the eternal verities. I think Peirce shares this same sentiment. The soul's deeper parts can only be reached to its surface. In this way, the eternal forms that mathematics and philosophy and the other sciences make us acquainted with will by slow percolation gradually reach the very core of one's being and will come to influence our lives. And this they will do not because they involve truths of merely vital importance, but because they are ideal and eternal verities. So based on this quite superficial exploration, it appears that Peirce and Vogling have surprisingly much overlap. Now, of course, they have their differences, but nevertheless, I think they had very similar starting points in their thinking. They both had same kind of understanding about the nature of reality and the role of philosophy and sort of even, even the purpose of humans and the purpose, purpose of creation, which is very interesting. So in summary, I see that there is an immense potential in connecting these thinkers. Peirce brings clarity to Vogling and arms Vogling with a very fundamental logical framework. And Vogling, in turn, helps us to apply Peirce. I think Vogling makes Peirce easier to, to become a tool for us in, in this time to solve problems that we now face existentially and as a civilization. So this is a win-win kind of situation. But thank you for watching. Please hit that subscribe button. Please hit that like button. And please share your ideas and thoughts in the comments below.